Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. As we do so, I wanted to just uh, uh, make a couple of comments as we're turning our Bibles there. Also make a statement uh, that, that we do have, uh, as a church, we are a worldwide fellowship. And uh, the leadership of, uh, those, of, the, of the fellowship has decided that uh, every four years we would try to have a conference together. That is what Orlando is all about. And so if you can make it to Orlando, that's great. But there are some of us who, who will never be able to make a trip like that. And we're wondering, how do I participate? How do I be a part of that? Uh, as much as I'd love to go, as much as I'd love to be a part of, part of something like that, how do I do that and still be part of this fellowship? We will be, I, I believe they will be streaming things live. And so you'll be able to listen to the lessons, and the lessons are pretty remarkable. And afterwards, all of the lessons will be saved uh, and, and will be available online for us to listen to. And so we'll be able to have that for us as well. So for those of us who can go, come on, that's going to be great. For those of us who are sitting there like, Saj, water from a rock, buddy. Water from a rock. I can't, I can't make something happen that I can't make happen. Uh, for those of us who are there, please remember, we still want you to participate. We, and you can uh, with some of the video that's going to be there. Amen? Amen. Uh, I wanted to make an acknowledgement. There is one among us who has become a doctor in our, in our time. And that is Thomas Williams. He has become a doctor. And you know, it is, uh, it's amazing to see what God does and how God moves, but uh, we have witnessed him become a doctor and looking forward to what God's going to do with that. Um, also, we had another brother of ours, and he, he went to the fire academy in the hopes to become a fireman. And uh, obviously, this is a dangerous job. And, uh, and so uh, I wanted to just bring him up and maybe uh, say a prayer over him as a fellowship so that he will be able to run into houses and magically, miraculously, supernaturally be protected as he brings out those who are in there. Uh, so this is Robert Poole. As an elder of the church, I will lay hands on him, and uh, let's bow our heads as a community and, and pray over our brother. Father, we come before you right now always in awe of what you do. And we know that you set the times and places in ways we can never understand. That, Father, you do things with a purpose and an intent that we cannot fathom. And so, Lord, it is with that understanding, that knowledge that, Father, you are omniscient, that, Father, you know what you're doing, uh, that, Lord, you place us in the positions, in the jobs, in, in the places where, Father, we can be the brightest light for you. And, and, Father, we know that is exactly what you have said in Robert's heart and that you have casted him forward in his career. We want to ask, as he starts this new career path, that, Lord, you protect him. I pray for angels to, to surround him as he, as he goes into dangerous situations. I pray that, Lord, he can, he can be a disciple and a light to all of those around him. I pray that, Father, you will guide him to the spaces and the places that will lift your name the highest. Thank you for his heart to be willing to do this. Please protect him. Please help him, Lord, as he endeavors to bring your name forward in a very dark world. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, also, if you guys are not aware, Connor McCormick has a, has a surgery tomorrow. Uh, he will be going in, and uh, he'll probably be in the hospital for the week. 
if you could please be praying for him as well, it would be greatly appreciated. Amen? Amen. So we have this set up uh, for a reason. This is not so that there can be a human being at the center stage. This is so that the word of God can be at the center stage. Uh, that we, that it, is a, it is an understanding for all those who enter those doors that it is not a man that leads this congregation, but it is Jesus. It is the word of God that moves us forward. And so at this time, I'm going to ask all of us to stand up for the reading of God's word. And our young brother, Jake, is going to do this. Let's bow our heads and listen to the reading. It's going to be Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to 24. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What? Is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate fr- and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you from all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life, and I will and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desires, uh, your desires will be f- uh, for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat, f- uh, eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles from you, and you will eat the plants of the field. But the sweat of your brow will will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living things. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man who has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden share of bim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Thank you, Jake. So we're in the middle of a series. It's called Step Into the Story. And the series is about us living a story. We all have a story, right? Each of us has a story. And the Bible says that there is a larger narrative. There is a larger story that's happening. And God is inviting us into that story. He's saying, take what you have and walk with me. Take your story and, become, and let it be a part of mine and watch what I can do. And so that's what we've been doing. We've been studying out the book of Genesis, looking at it, and asking ourselves, really, what does it take to step into God's story? So as we've been doing that, we've learned over the last few weeks that, number one, that we have to, we have to learn to say enough, Right? We have to learn that there is, there is a certain amount, that we, there's a certain place we can go to, and we have to learn to say enough. We looked at the temptation of Eve, right? That temptation of Eve was not what we thought it was. If you read about the temptation, what you learn is that it was not an increase in knowledge. Eve already knew right from wrong. If you read, the serpent approaches Eve and says, hey, why don't you eat from this tree? What was Eve's response? God said, don't do it. God said, don't do it. And she already knew right from wrong. She already understood a knowledge of good and evil. And yet, and yet, 
the serpent lied to her and promised her and said, and he said, if you eat from it, God knows that you will be like him. Why is that a lie? That's right. Who was humanity made in? Whose image was humanity made in? God's image. He was already like them. Adam and Eve was already like them. And what, 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 what the serpent was tempting Eve and Adam with was not so much, not so much knowledge or something else. Rather, it was, will you rest in God's story? Will you trust God's story? Will you trust that this is enough or will you always want more? And that, and that is one of the challenges of humanity. So from this story, we're going to pick it up and it's going to be, our, the title of our lesson is You Will Be Like God, which we know is a, is a deception. That the, the snake was trying to pull something deceptive, making Eve think that there was more to be had when really there wasn't. They were already like God. They were made in his image. And yet this discontentment that was created internally, that drove them to take steps that were in disobedience to God. But we get to this place where God comes in and he confronts humanity and he confronts the serpent. And he curses them, right? And if you look at the curse, you're going to pick up on something. He, you, you pick up that out of the garden, there comes two lineages. Can anyone tell me what those two lineages are? Lineage of the serpent and the lineage of the woman. So there's going to be two lines of, of humanity that come out. And if you read it, it says, your, your, it says to the serpent, your lineage, your children will bite the heel of man and he will stomp on them. Is that cool? So out of the garden will come two types of human beings. Two types. One will be animal-like, serpent-like. The other will be how man was made to be. They were made to be human. So what differentiates this? What differentiates a serpent versus a human being? What differentiates it is our trust in the story, our ability to trust in the story. So Adam and Eve, we pick up the story, have been kicked out of the garden, right? They've been asked to leave the garden. So we're going to pick up the story in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now it has to be understood, when the Lord did not look on favor, that doesn't mean the Lord despised Cain's offering. He just did not look on favor with it. It does not mean that Cain even sinned in that moment. It's real simple. He preferred one over the other. And yet it says, it says in scripture, Cain got very angry and his face was downcast. Now listen, this is what happens to all of us. This is, this is the point on the course and on the path and in your story where things will go two directions, one of two directions. You will either live the path of humanity that God meant you to live, or you will live the path of the serpent. And, and look at what happens. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin, look at, and look at the way it's described. Sin is crouching. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Cain, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. Do what is right, God says. 
And Cain decides he doesn't want to. He wants more. He will not trust the story. He will go and take control of his own path. And so what does Cain do? He acts like an animal. And he goes and he kills his brother. His brother didn't even do anything wrong to him. His brother just offered something to God that God favored over him. And Cain could not handle it. Each of us come to a place in our stories. Each of us comes to a place in our stories where sin is crouching at the door. And it desires to have you. And it might be, your, your, it might be choices that you have to make at work. It might be choices that you make in marriage. It might be choices that you make as a single man or woman, as a campus. It, it might be, but, but it always ends up at the place where decisions and choices need to be made. I want to ask you this morning, can you sit back and recall a moment where you were at that crossroads? and where you had to make a decision. Some of us made the right decision, right? We're like, hey man, I'm glad. But then there's other times where we didn't, where we didn't make the right decision. I remember to this day, <laughs> so I was about seven years old, maybe eight, and I found matches. Yeah, there's all sorts of bad. I found matches, and I thought to myself, I wonder what matches do. And I, I took these matches and I started lighting them. And, oh, oh. and then I thought, what if I gathered a lot of paper together? Now, we had an exceptionally dry summer in Buffalo, New York that particular year. And I was at a pivotal place. I was at a crossroads in my life. I had gathered, I had gathered the, the paper. I would set up right under a bush. And I said, okay, let's light this. The bush went up. The bush was between two houses. So this woman comes out. She goes, hey, what are you doing? I go, nothing. She goes, you started this fire. I go, no, I didn't. I was holding the matches in my hand. Me, I didn't do it. She goes, I'm calling the cops. I go, please don't. <laughs> Suddenly, the fire department, the police department. And I, I'm running out there with my little hose, trying to put this fire out. The fire department eventually came. And I remember hiding behind my mom. And I was watching my dad talk to the fire official. And then he turned and he looked at me. I'd gone down the wrong road. And I was going to pay the price. We're all, we can be at crossroads, and we have a choice. We can act like the serpent, we can act like the animal, or we can act as human beings, as God intended us to be. And it all comes down to, will we trust the story? Or most often, will we trust our emotions? In your relationships with each other, in our relationships with our family, with brothers and sisters, who do we trust? Do we trust our feelings or do we trust the story? See, when you trust the story, you will do what is right. So Marco and I, let's say Marco and I have a, have a tiff. Marco makes me mad. I am at a crossroads, Cain's crossroads. I can go around and I could talk about Marco behind his back. I could assassinate his reputation. He'd never know. But I'd be acting like an animal. But if I trust the story, what does the story tell me to do? The Bible says, if you have something against your brother, you go talk to your brother about it. If I trust the story, I go talk to Marco. And then Marco goes, I'm so sorry. And I go, no, I'm really sorry. And then we hug, and it's as if, and we move on. Trusting the story. So few human beings trust the story. 
We trust our emotions. We trust what we've learned to think. We rarely trust the story. Even men and women that claim to be disciples, they demonstrate their lack of trust by their actions, by their divisive natures. And, it, and we begin to act like animals. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate when we do what is right. The other day, Carlos came up to me. He goes, Saj, I am feeling so much. Can we talk? Can we talk? He goes, I'm not sure how to even compute what I'm feeling. Can we talk? And he was at a crossroads. He could have chosen to go down the road with his feelings, or he could be open about them and be able to be redirected and guided. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate Mickey. She's one of our teens. She's in the, back to, in the teen class. She has all these, she can have all these feelings, but I appreciate how she will fight to do what God guides her to do. It's awesome. When I witness it, when I watch her, I'm like, that's a young woman who trusts the story. The other day, I had somebody call me up. And they said, hey, listen, we're from Alaska. Compton. <laughs> <sighs> I'm still feeling stuff about that. But, uh, but they were, I, I thought, you're from Alaska. Are you talk, calling about the Comptons? They go, no, we're calling about someone else. And I go, really? Who are you calling about? They go, we're calling about one of the, one of the students in your ministry named Cody. He, he'd, like to, he'd like to do one of the leadership. He'd like to do one of the leadership things up here. And I'm like, Cody, OK. Yeah, let, what, what, do you want, what do you need to know? Well, is he someone you can trust? And I'm like, absolutely. I go, I would trust him with my children. I've watched him feel things really strong, and I've watched him do what is really right. I've watched him trust the story. And she goes, really? You would, that's, that's remarkable. What do you think are Cody's greatest assets? I go, Co some of Cody's greatest, and I went on to share what I thought were some of Cody's greatest assets. And she goes, wow, this kid sounds pretty amazing. I go, he is. And I said, you should meet the rest of our ministry. Because when I got off the phone, I thought to myself, I said that about Cody, but I could have said that about Keenan, about Alice. I could have said, and I went down the row, and I thought, that is our church. That, I could say that about so many of you. You trust the story. And when you trust the story, the lineage of the serpent dies. And the lineage of humanity lives on. Amen? Amen? The legacy of the serpent is profound. That's my second point. And unfortunately, I have to go through this kind of quick here. The, but the legacy of the serpent is, is long. So it starts with Adam and Eve, right? And it extends to their children, e, to Cain, right? Cain has a great, 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 great grandson la named Lamech. And listen to Lamech. Lamech is the first, uh, first person to have multiple wives. So in Genesis chapter 4, Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech. Hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. Okay, he's talking about himself in the third person. That right there is a problem. He's got issues. Lamech has issues. But do you see the progression? Do you see the animal-like progression? It starts with an individual. It extends to a couple, then extends to their children, extends then to their extended family. If you continue reading in Genesis chapter 6, Verse 9, it says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. It started with Adam and Eve. It moved to Cain. It then moved to Lamech. And then... The entire world. The entire world was corrupt. 
The legacy of the serpent is profound. Your choices are profound. What you decide to do in your marriage, in your relationships, with your children, with your friends, leaves a legacy. Because you will either act like a man or a woman or act like an animal. And others will notice and others will follow suit. You will either trust the story or you will not trust the story. The story continues. After that to the Tower of Babel, an entire group of people trying to go to God. It continues with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you guys remember the story of Jacob? Jacob lies to his father. How does he lie to his father? He pretends he's his brother. How does he do it? By killing a sheep, putting the, 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 the wool of the sheep on him, and pretending to be his brother. Jacob acts, kills an animal, disguises himself as an animal to be an animal. It continues. It continues. Jacob couldn't trust the story. Jacob couldn't trust the story. And as a result of his inability to trust the story, he acted like an animal. The lineage of the serpent lives on. The lineage of the serpent moves on. The lineage of the serpent continues to plague us. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus comes around, <clears throat> Jesus has a phrase for himself. I love this phrase because it ties very deeply to the lesson that we're talking about today. Jesus calls himself many things, but his favorite is a phrase we're going to read right here. <coughs> so in verse 20, The Bible says, Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of the serpent, no, the son of man has no place to lay his head. What did Jesus call himself? Son of man. Why? It, there's, there's, there's a legacy here that goes into Daniel chapter 7. I would encourage you to look at it. We don't have the time to do it this morning. But he is the son of man, and he is making a distinction to the entire world. I am not the son of the serpent. I will trust the story. I will be fully human. He is the son of man. He is the son of man. And being the son of man, he was able to do something for us that no one else could. He was probably the first fully human being who, who trusted God all the way down. Moses, David, you read the Old Testament, you're always kind of taken aback by how, how blatant they are with the people's sins. These are the heroes of the Hebrew nation, yet the Bible has no qualms about showing their shortcomings. And yet the Bible tells us there was one who lived absolutely perfectly, and his name was Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible reads, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Love this part. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his great pleasure, which he purposed in Christ 
to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. Did, you, did we catch that? We are sons and daughters. We become fully human. At what point? At what point when the blood of Christ is on us? See, the one, the one individual that actually lived like a human being, fully like a human being, from beginning to end, Jesus, when he shed blood for us, it removed from us the lineage of the snake. It forgave, it forgave us of the sins that we commit. Now, many of us, I know for me, I sit there and I look at myself, and I, I do, I have an honest, sincere look in the mirror, and I, I can always see, well, I can see many of my shortcomings. And I think to myself, what am I going to do? How do I overcome this? It looks as if I will always be in the lineage of the snake. And yet the Bible says, if, if you do what is right, if you do what is right, you will be taken care of. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. So what do we do? What do we do? If we do what is right. In verse 36, we pick up in the middle of a Peter's sermon. And he's talking to the Jews. And the Jews realize what they've done. And listen to what it says. It says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and your children and for all who are far off, for whom the Lord our God will call. He's giving them a way out. He's saying, repent, be baptized. If you're here for the first time, I want to encourage you, sit down and study the scriptures. Look at what it says. And look at what it means to be in the lineage of humanity, in the lineage of Eve, and see where that can take you. And see what it means to follow Jesus fully. For those of us who've made Jesus Lord and have been baptized, ask yourself, how, has thing, how have things been going? Because he gives you a process as well, right? If you've fallen short, what are we to do? James chapter 5 says, confess your sins to one another and pray so that you may be healed collectively we may be healed as 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 a family as a group when we live that way when we do what is right when we trust the story we witness absolutely incredible things that god's able to do but more than what he's able to do with our lives we get to live fully human we get to live the way we were meant to live. Come join us in the story. Watch what he can do. Thank you.